I'm chatting with Dr. Richard Warshak in this web exclusive interview. Dr. Warshak, we were talking about parental alienation on the show, and uh, I think that we may not have adequately emphasized that sometimes alienation can be inadvertent. Comments that parents make in front of the children about the other parent. Right. Sometimes parents just don't appreciate the damage that they're doing when they let their children overhear them denigrating the other parents, sometimes telling the children directly. Their intention is not to turn the child against the other parent. They're just wanting to vent some of the anger and frustration they feel and the disappointment they feel in the failure of the marriage. But there are other parents who are very deliberate about this. I just recently got an email from a mother who told me that, that a, a nine-year-old girl's father told her that if she spent time with her mother and the mother's boyfriend, he was going to take her puppy away and he would stop loving her. Now that's a deliberate attempt to get the child to reject her mother. Uh, and I, I should also point out that um, rich people are no, not immune from this. Even the rich and famous. That's correct. The rich and famous are not immune. They engage in these same tactics, withholding the child from the other parent, sometimes trying to move far away so that the child can't have a relationship with that parent, demeaning the other parent, denigrating the other parent. Uh, One of the most important contributions you've made to this field is the creation of workshops that assist parents and children to reunite, to heal. Yes, because what happens is very often the court recognizes that it's not in the child's best interest to reject and avoid a parent, but the child is so adamant that they will not stay with that. They will run away. They'll hurt themselves. They'll hurt their parent. That the family needs some way to ease the transition, to give the child a safe way to uh, quickly reconnect with the parents. So we offer a four-day workshop where we teach the the children and the rejected parent how to get along. We teach the child how easy it is to develop inaccurate negative viewpoints, you know, how you can develop a negative stereotype about someone when it's not when it's not justified. We teach them about how you can resolve conflict in more peaceful ways. We can teach them about how important it is for children to have a relationship with both parents. And we also teach the parent how to more sensitively manage the child's behavior. Children usually are very relieved when they're able and given permission to recover their love and affection for a parent. Even if they've been saying all along they they don't want to see the other parent, they've been turned against that other parent, and they truly believe that other parent is evil. You find that they, once they've been told, okay, you're going to live with that parent, they, they are able to adjust to it fairly easily? Yes, people are so surprised at how quickly the child's threats evaporate. Once the child, once the adults in the situation have set a limit for the child and said failure is not an option, we, the court has listened to all the evidence, we've heard all the bad things you've said about your mother or about your father, you know, and, and we've decided that she's not as bad a mother as you think she is and she deserves your love and you're going to make this work. And the court puts some teeth into it with the children and says, in fact, you're not going to be spending time with your other parent until you repair this damaged relationship. That's all the kids need to hear. They get, they get a sense of relief because they never stopped loving a parent that they had loved all these years. They just didn't feel free to express it. And those workshops are called Family Bridges. They're called Family Bridges. They, they, it's a four-day workshop. And you, even, I was astounded the first time I, I saw this workshop work so effectively because it's only four days in the wake sometimes of years of rejection. Mm -hmm. But the children haven't appreciated uh, how much they've suspended their critical thinking, how much they've been influenced by identifying with the negativity of one parent toward the other. And so once they learn about this, we give them a face-saving way to basically say uh, that was the past, we're going to move on to a better future with the family. Now in our remaining moments, I just want to ask you, I found chapter 9 of your book the most painful, letting go. Mm -hmm. You have addressed the realistic issue for some people that in certain situations you have, you, you, if you've been alienated, it's time to let go. You know, I hear from a lot of parents who say that they had the most difficult time getting through that chapter just because it was so painful for them to read. I found it hard to read. It, it, it is a tough, but there are it's situations. Like, it's, it's like mourning for a, a child you've lost permanently. It, exactly, but but psychologists call this an ambiguous loss because it's the child's not really gone. The child may be living right down the block, and you never know when there will be a reconciliation in the future. Or if. 
or if there will be. But sometimes you've exhausted all your resources. There's nothing the court feels they can do. You don't feel it can be safe for the children to come back. You've got to let go. But even then, you don't give up on the children. You plant seeds for a future reconciliation, and you let them know that the door is open. Thank you, Dr. Warshak. Our door is always open to you, and I hope you'll come back to the show. That would be my pleasure. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank you.